In Islam, they teach that there's a figure coming that's called al Masiya Dajjal. That means the false messiah. And Muslims believe that the false messiah is the Jesus of the Bible. Okay, so all this talk about Muslims, oh, we love Jesus, we honor Jesus. Okay, their Jesus is very different than the Jesus of the Bible, and they consider the Jesus of the Bible the one that we believe is coming back as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. They believe, Brandon, that he is the Antichrist. He's going to be the Antichrist. By the way, isn't that That's interesting that Jesus himself in Matthew 24 warns about false Christ and false messiahs? So it, we, we oftentimes maybe don't think about false Christ or false messiahs when it comes to Islam. We think about maybe the New Age movement, uh, uh, cults, but we don't think about it as Islam. So you're saying, Sharam, as a former Muslim from Iran who studied this and grew up with this, you're saying Islam also has a false Christ. And they declare that the Jesus of the Bible is that false Christ. Absolutely. They talk openly about the fact that there will be a coming Antichrist. They use that terminology. And therefore, that Antichrist, they believe, will be the Jesus of the Bible because he was never crucified. Don't forget, the Quran says Jesus was never crucified, never resurrected, never claimed to be the Son of God, never claimed to be God, is not the Messiah in the sense that there's no atonement. So now, because Christians believe all that I just said, they and the world is going to be deceived to follow this Antichrist figure. So again, there's no common ground okay, so I want here. to make sure I got it straight. I want to make yeah. sure our audience has it straight. There's, there, there is a false Christ in the, in, in the Islamic world. They're looking for their, their guy to come, their Mahdi. How do you say it, Mahdi? The Mahdi, yeah, M-A-H-D-I, M-A-H-D-I. So they're yeah. looking for their Mahdi to come, which will, will mirrors the Antichrist as described in the Bible, but to them that will be their Messiah. So that's a false Christ or a false Messiah. But they look at the Jesus of the Bible as being the Antichrist. So in, every, in other words, everything is flipped. What we call meeting the description of the Antichrist this individual they're waiting for, the New Agers are waiting for, the globalists are waiting for, this guy will fulfill all of their expectations and desires. And so even the Islamic world is waiting on the Antichrist. That's what we call him. But we, Christians, who follow Jesus, they say our Jesus, who's coming back to defeat all this false Antichrist, this Antichrist, they believe our Jesus is the Antichrist. So both sides are calling the other side's figure or savior or Jesus the Antichrist, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Because now if you look at the Bible side of things and we look at the description of the Antichrist, right, that he's going to come uh, as a rider on the one horse, right, Revelation, I'm sorry, on a white horse, Revelation chapter 6, right, the first seal, he's going to be the rider on the white horse coming to, to conquer and to, uh, to, to, be, to, to conquer and, 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 and bring uh, ultimately war, the, the, the element of, of the bow. It's interesting because they, Muslims now say the Mahdi will ride, be, be coming on a white horse, so that's how the description of the Mahdi is. He's going to ride on a white horse to come and conquer for Islam. Then, if you go back to that, can you go back to that slide really quick? Yeah. You'll see, folks, on that slide. Now it says, look at this, that this Mahdi, which is their not just the Islamic ruler, but they believe he will be a world ruler and he will rule Muslims and non-Muslims. Look at this, folks. The Mahdi will establish then a peace agreement specifically with a Jew and the, the uh, Islamic sources say Romans or what they think of Christians. So he will come and usher in a peace agreement with Jews and Romans or Christians. And then you see there in Abu Dawood, which is also a hadith, the last point of that, of the bullet points, this specifically says he will then rule for seven years. Now again, you gotta understand, Brandon, this is blowing my mind when I'm looking at this as a baby Christian. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is exactly what Islam teaches. The Antichrist in the Bible, the one who will come, he'll be a rider on the white, white horse. He's going to come to conquer. He's going to rule the nations, global government. He's going to make a covenant with Christians and Jews because he's got to bring peace, correct? And then he's going to rule for seven years. Doesn't that sound like the Antichrist of the Bible?
Isn't that exactly what the Bible describes, the tribulation period, and what the Antichrist will do, and then he will then uh, cause all to worship him? That's what Muslims teach as well, that he's going to first come to bring peace, and then once he brings peace, just like Muhammad did, he's going to break the peace, and then he's going to destroy the Jews and the Christians. He's going to destroy the cross. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, Jesus is coming back with him according to Islam, but this Jesus is only going to be a prophet, not 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 the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He's just a prophet, and he's going to come in, and he's going to usher in Islam with the Antichrist. He's going to break the cross, because remember, they claim it never happened, and he's going to kill Jews. What? The Jewish Messiah? He's going to come? You guys see that? So Islam believes that that uh, Jesus is of the Bible is the Antichrist. Islam believes that Jesus is going to come back only as a prophet and he'll be secondary to the Mahdi. You'll see that in the second point there. Then this Jesus and, uh, and the Mahdi will destroy Christianity. They, they, they will break the cross. So there's no more Christianity. And then he's going to establish Islamic law for the whole world. And then, according to Sahih Bukhari, you see on the last point there, which is a hadith of Muhammad, he will then kill all the Jews. So this is unbelievable, Brandon, how much we're talking about the opposite of it. This is the verse here. You see this? That the the hour will not, this is according to Muhammad, the hour will not be established. That means the hour of Islam. Until the son of Mary descends among you as a just ruler, he will break the cross kill the pigs, which is a derogatory term for Jews, and he will abolish the jizya tax, which is a tax that non-Muslims must pay when they're being governed or ruled by Muslims to be protected. It's, it's kind of like an extortion tax that the mafia charges. It's the same thing in Islam. And they've been doing this for the 1,400 years that they've existed. So it is unbelievable when you think about, number one, the anti-Semitism that is in Islam. Islam is the most anti-Semitic belief system on the planet today. That's why the greatest anti-Semitism uh, statistically comes from the Middle East. And the, the highest anti-Semitism comes from Gaza and the West Bank, among the so-called Palestinians that you did a great job explaining in the intro, that there is no such thing as Palestinians or Palestine. But this is how... Uh, virulently anti-Semitic. And look at this verse, by the way. This is this is the verse that Hamas uses in their charter. This is the verse that is being preached in mosques around the world. This is the verse that um, that Muslims will 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 dictate that is going to be uh, accomplished. Look at this. The last hour will not come unless Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims who kill them would kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind the stone or a tree and a stone or a tree would say, uh, Muslim or the servant of Allah, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So they believe that their Messiah, the Mahdi, will come with Jesus, a prophet. Then they will both uh, break Christianity, put an end to Christianity, uh, put an end to all the stuff about, uh, uh, you know, the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Then they will establish Islam on the planet and they will then wage war on the Jews and annihilate the Jews until there is not any Jews left on the planet. That's what Islam teaches, which is the opposite of the Bible. Doesn't that sound like the Antichrist? Doesn't that sound like exactly what's going to happen during the tribulation where the Antichrist is going to bring false peace with the Jews and with the rest of the world? He will affirm a covenant with many for seven years and then halfway through break the covenant, set himself up as being God and establish globally. Uh, so, you know, uh, Brandon, you, you and I talked about this. A lot of Bible scholars just refuse to look at Islam as a part of the equation in uh, the coming of the Antichrist and the coming of these last days. But I, I hope that this shows yes. there is uh, a powerful, at least within Islam, there's a powerful doctrine they have on eschatology. You know, and, and Bible scholars disagree on this one. I mean, people we agree with on so many issues and they all agree on so many issues. They have different things they disagree on. One of them is, will the Antichrist be Jewish? Because you would say, how are you? I mean, if they think he's the Messiah, then certainly he would have to come from the line of David. Right. Others will say he'll be a, he'll be a Gentile. You know, part of me wonders, <laughs> is it possible he could be half Jewish, half 
Muslim, come from a, a Muslim line and a Jewish line. You know, someone uh, out of the Middle East that that has a, a you know a, a dual uh, lineage. What say you? Uh, that's possible. It's certainly possible. I don't think that the Antichrist will be specifically and only Jewish. I definitely do think that there's a possibility of that mixture because of the fact that uh, this figure must be accepted both by Jews and by Muslims. Uh, and of course, by deceived uh, uh, those who claim to be Christians, because we know from Revelation 13 uh, and the description of the second beast in verse 11, that the false prophet or the false religious system, which I believe is ultimately the one world religion that's rising, um, this that it, that this individual, this beast looks like a lamb uh, with two horns, but yet when he speaks, he speaks like a dragon. So I've always believed that there's some version of a corrupted Christianity in the mix of this, uh, along with Jew, Jew, Jews and Muslims. So it's very possible that the Antichrist could be a mixture. Uh, however, what we must know is that he will then appease both the Muslims and the Jews for a period because of the fact that he's going to bring peace. And that peace is false. Within Islam, we know that they promote deception. We know that they promote the idea that you can make a treaty and break a treaty. Uh, this was done, this is done routinely within Islam. Uh, so I think it's very likely that they will come in. And you asked me earlier the question, how will they convince the Jews to go along potentially with an, with a Muslim Messiah, an Islamic Messiah or a mixture? It all has to do, in my opinion, Brandon, with how desperately the Jews want the third temple. It is all about the third temple, and they're willing to do almost anything to get that third temple because they believe the third temple will usher in their Messiah, who they've been waiting for. And that Messiah is going to allow them to once again worship. And in Israel today, they are building high speed rail from uh, Tel Aviv, from Ben Gurion Airport to the Temple Mount, it's supposed to be finished next year. They have everything ready to reinstitute the sacrifices, including potentially the red heifers. Um, all they need is a location. But yet right now, the Muslims control the Temple Mount as far as religiously. The Jews, I, I think most people don't know that. Most people don't know that the Jews do not control the Temple Mount religiously. It is the Jordanian council called the Waqf, W-A-Q-F, that controls what happens in the Temple Mount. They have very strict rules for uh, how Christians and Jews can go onto the Temple Mount and they can't openly worship uh, like the Muslims. So could it be that the Antichrist will come and as he ushers in this covenant, the condition of the covenant will be to allow the Jews to once again rebuild the third temple, share, I've always believed that they're going to share the Temple Mount just like they're doing right now in Abu Dhabi. In the United Arab Emirates, they created that Abrahamic family house with a mosque, a synagogue, and a church all on the same property, claiming they all worship the one God, which, of course, we know is deception. But couldn't they do that in Jerusalem? Couldn't this agreement from the Antichrist bringing false peace also include the permission to allow the Jews to build the third temple as long as they're not proselytizing or trying to convert like uh, the agreements that they have with the Christians, for example. Well, we, we also have that going on in Nebraska. Don't we have the three houses of worship in Nebraska now, too? In Nebraska, in Boston, in, Berzi in, in Berlin, all around the world, they're calling these places houses of one. So they're called houses of one, the idea that we all worship one God. And if you listen to videos from the Temple Mount Institute, by the way, I sent you, I don't know, did you get that image of the Christians on the Temple Mount? I sent you that, that, that email. Um, this is very interesting because again, you have to see the subjugation. The Muslims control the religious practices of, of the Temple Mount. So the houses of one, go. the premises, yeah, uh, the premises, we all worship, um, one God. So here is a picture of earlier this year. You see the Jews, right? The Jews are there and they're, they're very strict on what they're allowed to do. They can't proselytize. They can't openly worship. But all of those people that are wearing, you see uh, the yellow um, uh, hoodies and the yellow outfits. Those were given to them by the Jordanian Islamic Council that controls the Temple Mount. And that is a sign of subjugation. It is called dimitude. This is throughout Islamic history. In fact, the article uh, that you have there 
goes to tell you that the Baghdad Caliphate, non-Muslims were ordered to wear yellow pieces of clothing. Uh, during the Mamluk rule in the 13th to 16th centuries, non-Muslims referred to as dimi. That's the term they give non-Muslims who are subjugated. Dimitude is a term for those who are subjugated. were forced to wear yellow clothes to distinguish them from Muslims. There is a term, there's a belt called the Zunar, and that Christians would wear uh, throughout subjugation uh, that was uh, a belt that was yellow. So who do we know, Brandon, in history that forced Jews or forced anybody to wear yellow? We know that Hitler did that, correct? The Nazis did that, but yet right. he didn't come up with the idea. I believe he got the idea from the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini. I believe he got the idea from the Muslims who've been doing this for centuries. They've been subjugating. So here's the Christians, and they have to wear these uh, outfits to distinguish them as dimmies. There's the history. It talks about the history that throughout Islamic history, the various caliphs forced non-Muslims to be subjugated and they had to wear yellow uh, garments, specifically yellow or sometimes other colors. But specifically yellow was the major color, particularly for Christians, that they had to wear. And that's why we get, I believe, the idea where we get the yellow star. So they're already doing this on the Temple Mount. They're already doing this. So what if the Antichrist will come? He'll appease the Jews by bringing the peace and bringing the agreement of worship on the Temple Mount to build the third temple. He'll appease the Muslims because he will still be in control. They'll be in control of that area. And the Muslims get what they want because they know, they know that this Mahdi and the false Jesus that comes with the Mahdi, it's just the show. Once they get power, then they will d kill all the Jews. They'll turn on the Jews, kill all the Jews, and then they will um, establish Islam throughout the world. Now, uh, many will say, well, what about the globalist? What about the red part of this green, red and green access? Well, we know that the globalists are working with the Muslims. They have the same agenda. They have the same goal. They have the same Islamic or, or the same uh, uh, global totalitarian mindset. The question is, who will win out at the end? That's the question, right? And ultimately, we don't know. But we know that the Antichrist has certain characteristics and every characteristic, Brandon, every characteristic of the Antichrist in the Bible sounds like the Islamic Messiah, the Mahdi. I mean, it's it's uncanny. It's uncanny. I mean, it's uncanny if you look at all. And this is all happening at a time. It is, and it's all happening at a time when interfaith dialogue is being so embraced globally and even within so-called evangelicalism and people that once spoke about it are defending people that are doing it, like James White with Josser Cotty, and yet you think they would have cut him off because they claim we can't do these things. Certain pastors and theologians and so-called theologians and seminaries, and yet they keep inviting James White back. So the point I'm making is, if the so-called Bible-defending evangelical Christians are going to accept interfaith dialogue, why would we not expect that many in the world will do it and allow for this syncretism of religions to come together? Particularly when Chrislam, Christianity and Islam are merging so much and people are signing on to the Yale document saying Muslims and Christians worship the same God, when we know that the God of the Bible's description is not that in the Quran, uh, Jesus is was God incarnate, laid down his life, and rose again. And we know that the God, uh, so-called, quote, God of Islam, Allah, would never take on human form, never lay down his life for someone else, is not a personal God. The description of Allah in the Quran matches the description of Satan in the Bible, and yet they will tell us, oh, yeah, we worship the same God because this is how they deceive stupid uh, people to believe that Christianity and Islam can be merged, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And people like James White and evangelicals who are pushing not just interfaith, right, because interfaith was between Muslims and Christians. Now they've gone to promoting multi-faith. So now we've got to bring the Jews in. This is where the deception comes. Because at a time where now we are seeing rampant anti-Semitism and Jew hatred, we're not just seeing it from, from within Hamas or the Muslim world, which again, that's to be expected if we know anything about Islam. But we're seeing it from within evangelicalism, within Reformed theology, within those who are uh, replaced in theology or covenant theology or partial preterists or preterists. We're seeing this, this, this 
you know, at least the birth pangs of anti-Semitism, if not full-blown anti-Semitism and Jew hatred and some. And it's, it's just blowing my mind.